On a quiet street in what is now a quiet part of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, 46 bricks have been laid in the sidewalk. It is a very understated memorial to an event that put the Gallup Police Point Pleasant area on the map in the worst way imaginable. Instead of fame, it brought infamy. Behind me, a section of flood wall is a little lighter in color, obviously newer, but there's little other indication that this was the site a quarter of a century ago, December 15, 1967, that the Silver Bridge fell. The 46 bricks honor the 46 lives lost that night. Bigger cities have broader shoulders, but a disaster of this magnitude is almost more weight than hometown communities like Point Pleasant, West Virginia and Gallipolis, Ohio can bear. Just about anyone who lived in the area at the time knew someone lost on the bridge. Tonight, we'll look back at a moment now frozen in history through the eyes of those that remember it best. From the memory of Paul Scott, one of only five people to have fallen into the Ohio River with the bridge and lived to tell about it. To the riverboat dispatcher who pulled Scott from the icy water. We'll see the bridge fall through the eyes of the first witness to report the event to the authorities. And we'll hear from the Ohio State Patrol trooper who, almost in disbelief, responded to that call. And on behalf of the 46 families ultimately affected, Chris Ray, whose brother died that night. I myself lived in Point Pleasant in December of 1967, and though very young, I vividly remember that night. In fact, my brother was headed to a church function in Gallup Police, and the family friend who came to pick him up had just crossed the Silver Bridge. She was waiting here at a stoplight on the West Virginia side. As she waited for it to turn green, the bridge collapsed behind her. This intersection vividly demonstrates just how much things have changed since December 15, 1967. It was once the busiest place in town. The collapse of the Silver Bridge so completely altered the fabric of these two communities that any date after December 15, 1967 could be called simply after the bridge fell. In the summer of 1928, anyone could walk into a drugstore on Main Street in Point Pleasant and, for a nickel, buy this postcard. On the back, it read, A shining example of man's engineering ingenuity is this magnificent bridge in historic Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Dedicated before a crowd of 25,000 on May 30th of that year, the design was completely original. Though the original plans called for a suspension bridge using spun steel bridge cable, the Silver Bridge instead pioneered the heat-treated I-bar chain suspension. This is an actual piece of an I-bar from the Silver Bridge. As far as anyone knows, it's the only one that still exists. The bridge was supported by a chain of I-bars held together by a pin like this one. In 1928, the design was called unique and revolutionary. Forty years later, it could only be called tragic. It was never officially named the Silver Bridge. The Ohio River Bridge got that nickname because it was painted with aluminum paint, another first. The nickname stuck, and no one ever called it anything else. It was in many ways a gateway to the southeast. It spanned the Ohio River for the primary north-south corridor at that time. For some, the bridge was almost a work of engineering art, all gleaming silver paint and graceful curves. Others thought little of it, concerned more with the condition of the Shadle Bridge a few hundred yards south or the dilapidated railroad bridge just upriver. I thought it was a good bridge. I never thought anything about it. I, uh, I worried about a bridge. It was, a, it was the bridges on the railroad. They were pretty rusted and that one next to it. I worried about it because we went over it a lot of times, you know, uh, all the trains crossed that bridge out at the Point Pleasant. 
And uh, you just look at it today, and you don't wonder how they were standing there. But still others found the Silver Bridge to be disturbing. Many thought the constant quivering and 40-year-old rusting steel a tragedy waiting to happen. For Chris Ray, a trip to Point Pleasant on December 2nd of 1967 turned out to be an eerie omen. Her brother was driving as they crossed the bridge into town, his young wife beside him in the front seat. She hit her face and his shoulder when we crossed the Silver Bridge, and he said, she's scared to death of this bridge. And I said, why? And she said, I'm just afraid it's going to fall. And he said, I, I keep trying to tell her this bridge is going to be here a long time after we're gone. And it just, you know, that was 13 days before the bridge fell and he was on it. When the Point Pleasant Register hit the doorstep on December 15, 1967, area residents were greeted with headlines trumpeting a premature winter storm, wreaking havoc across the southeast. In Mason County, some flurries were predicted, along with bone-chilling cold. The Rotary Club would be out that night, the paper said, raising money to buy holiday baskets for the needy. A young Kanawha County delegate named Jay Rockefeller was slated to speak before a gathering of young Democrats at the county courthouse. The most serious news of the day was happening halfway around the world. No one could have imagined that the top story the next day, headlining the front page of newspapers the world over, would unfold three blocks from the Point Pleasant Register office. On the day that the bridge fell, I was um, waiting on my brother to come pick me up. We were going to take my daughter over to Point Pleasant to get her picture taken. Well, he came over to pick me up, and she had went to sleep, which she never takes a nap, but she went to sleep that day, so I told him I'd have to catch him later, and then he went on without me. Dickie Maxwell was a 20-year-old Gallup police man, married only six months, his wife waiting at home while he took an hour or so to pick up a Christmas present in Point Pleasant. He loved his family. He was just a good guy. He cared about people. Very compassionate person. At four minutes until five, the bridge was filled, bumper to bumper, with rush hour traffic. A long string of cars stretched toward the center of the bridge in the westbound lane, backed up by a traffic light on the Ohio end of the bridge. More than 60 people huddling in their cars from the cold outside, the icy water below. It was extremely cold. In fact, uh, that evening when it happened, the, the temperature was 28 degrees. And the traffic uh, conditions at that hour was heavy due to the holiday traffic. And we also had uh, a lot of people on the bridge from the Goodyear plant. The timing couldn't have been worse. Holiday shoppers mingled with commuters from area plants, truckers hauling goods from the south, dump trucks loaded with gravel. High school basketball teams warmed up in the Point Pleasant High School gymnasium. Dickie Maxwell was stopped toward the end of the line of traffic headed toward Gallup Police. He may have rushed the light on the West Virginia side to be there. He was coming back that evening to put Christmas lights up around the house and um, needless to say, they didn't get put up. Maxwell delivered newspapers for the Huntington Herald Dispatch, newspapers that for months would be filled with accounts of an event that would soon take his life. Just a few cars ahead, Paul Scott waited in line with co-workers Fred Miller and James Pullen, railroad workers on the way home from the rail yards and institute. It was, it was just a routine day coming home from work one what my wife's gonna have for supper, which she had a ham in the oven, and I didn't know it, of course, but just was glad to get home from work, and we didn't quite make it. The few that survived the next few moments all say conversation turned to the bridge itself, by that time beginning to shake. We stopped behind the traffic in the middle of the center of the bridge, and had a couple of three Bull stations, not too long, just talking, having a conversation like three railroad men would do. And the bridge began shaking pretty strong, and we got to talking about that. At about that time, a worker at the city ice and fuel boat dock along the West Virginia Riverbank became bored waiting for a boat to arrive. He had a perfect view of the Silver Bridge, so in his boredom, he began to slowly count the cars. Meanwhile, a few feet away, his manager was about ready to call it a day. I was getting ready to go home, and uh, 
and we were just sitting there, and, uh, and uh, that one fellow happened to be at the window. He'd been counting the cars on the bridge, he said. And From the back seat of one of those cars, Paul Scott began to tell his friends a story to settle their nerves and his over the bridge now shaking violently beneath them. You know the building in highest building in Columbus was AIU building. That's what they called it when I was a kid, now it's some other name. And they was talking about the bridge shaking. And uh, I said, well, you don't have to worry about that. I said, that AIU building in Columbus, I said, that top of that sways as much as three or four feet. If, if it didn't sway, if it didn't give, I said, it's gonna bust. It's got to give. The bridge always shook, but not like this. Above their heads, Ibar Joint C-13 was falling apart. 40 years of traffic, the elements, and neglect had taken their toll. The eyelet snapped, and the rest was a chain reaction. There was a loud crash, and I ran over to the kitchen window and looked out, and the bridge was still standing at that time, the rails and stuff. But the, the floor was dropping out of it then, and it dumped the cars off into the river, and then the, the floor just fell on top of it. He went over to the window, and he says, well, the damn bridge is falling. And it just started more or less on the high side and worked back to the West Virginia side, just like dominoes falling, and just kind of worked its way back. The entire structure of the bridge began to slowly self-destruct. The anchorage at the Ohio approach pulled free, and the bridge, still partially suspended by the remaining I-bar chain, flipped the flooring upside down, dumping its load of cars, concrete piling in on top. And then the sides of the bridge got to trembling, and then it fell down on top of everything. Little by little, the steel superstructure disintegrated, falling first on the Ohio side, the 90-foot Ohio tower tumbling into the water, working back toward West Virginia. For those on the bridge, it was confusing and horrifying as a frantic struggle for survival began. And then we seen the upper side of the bridge break loose and start to tumble towards us. That's when I thought I could fly, step out the door and set off for West Virginia. Got about a car length behind our car and she went down. Paul Scott's first thought was to run. So when a front seat passenger opened a door, Scott ran for his life. Fred Miller, who'd opened the door, apparently to run himself, changed his mind, got back in the car, and with the driver, James Pullen, went down with the bridge. Scott didn't run far. As he felt the bridge collapse below him, he simply held on. Grabbed all that railing and it hanged on through the air. I could feel myself going through space, hanging on that railing, and wondering how I was going to climb back up on the bridge but then I hit the water. His first thought was how to position himself as he fell to climb back onto a bridge that no longer existed. Instinct, though, told him to swim away from the falling debris. As the floor of the bridge flipped over, it had thrown Scott clear on the opposite side from where he'd been standing. I tried to swim away from our bridge, but decided I better try to get to the top where I get some air and when I come up, well, I was about 100 yards south of that bridge. Struggling in 32 degree water, hands too cold to feel, gasping for air, it looked as if Scott had survived the worst bridge disaster in modern history, only to be claimed by the Ohio River. You were just almost helpless, almost helpless. You couldn't see much hope. I thought I was gone. At the city ice and fuel dock, Bill McCormick and his staff stood stunned, trying to determine what to do next. One way saw what had happened, well, I said, well, we better get out and see if we can, anybody in the water. As the men set out in a small motorboat, huge waves from the collapse of the bridge hit them, nearly spilling one man into the water. He went on the outside there, and I didn't know what had happened, whether he'd fallen in the water or what. <laughs> but uh, then he came on and said, well, let's go. And Paul Scott had grown up along the river. The swimming skills he developed as a child now kept him above water in the crisis of his life. I started for help. Looked at the bank, thought I'd try to swim to the bank, and decided that if I did, it'd have to be a catty corn. It'd have to be swim down the river and go into a gradual. Then I looked across the river and I seen a boat coming my direction. And after I found a bale of rubber or something and hung on to it till it got over and picked us up. 
four other men had also somehow bobbed to the surface. Around them were various items floating in the water, including Christmas presents from the now submerged cars of holiday shoppers. We started on the more or less on the West Virginia side and picked up the two, and then we worked out a little toward the middle of the river and picked up the other fellow, and then uh, the last one hired Boggs was more or less on the high side. His car had been almost across the bridge there on the high side. McCormick's boat pulled in four. Another city ice and fuel boat rescued one other. A truck driver from North Carolina holding on to his semi-trailer kept afloat by its load of mattresses. They were the only five people to go into the river and survive. The collapse itself had taken about 45 seconds. The rescue from the water, only minutes. But the most painful part of the story had just begun. The spectacle of watching a landmark that had been standing for nearly 40 years collapse, taking with it dozens of lives, left a group of witnesses on the riverbank in shock. Roy Sayer, a Gallipolis truck driver, watched the disaster happen almost in his backyard. He was the first to officially report an event that he had trouble believing himself. I called the state highway patrol. I had the girls the telephone come to hook me up with them, and I reported it was missing. You know, fell in. Couldn't believe it. And the dispatcher at the patrol post took the call. He couldn't believe it. And uh, one of the crazy things that happened that night, after they uh, called me, I uh, had my uh, wife to try to call out some of our highway patrol auxiliarymen that are made up of Legion members, American Legion members, and the phone was dead, just like the, the lines were open. The switchboards were overloaded. Communications were down. Families became frantic, wondering if their loved ones had been on the bridge. Commuters stranded on the opposite side of the river couldn't call home to let their families know they were safe. The closest bridge over the river now lay 25 miles away in Pomeroy. My husband and myself took our little girl and we was going downtown to Calpolis and we saw a bunch of ambulances go up, uh, seven. And we decided to see what was going on and I got up there and, and saw what was going on and of course I was scared because I didn't know where all my family, I didn't know if any of my family was on it or anything. She soon learned that Dickie Maxwell hadn't made it home from Point Pleasant. We immediately went to Point Pleasant, uh, come up through Pomeroy, and went to uh, Point Pleasant to look for him. We couldn't find him. We went into the store that, that he was supposed to pick up a layaway at, and uh, they said he had been there and he had picked up the layaway. So all we could do was go back home and wait to hear something. It was a similar story for countless others. As phones began to sporadically work again, Rescue officials were inundated with calls literally from around the world. People were calling us all during the night, even from England, trying to get the information on this bridge. We got calls actually from England. On the Ohio River Bank, the Silver Bridge approach spanned over dry ground for several hundred feet before reaching the river. State Patrol Sergeant Carl Boggs headed a team of rescuers sifting through tangled wreckage for survivors, whisking the injured away to local hospitals. By that time, Paul Scott had already been taken to Pleasant Valley Hospital in Point Pleasant. My daughter was uh, going to get married on the 30th of December. And of course, I was supposed to walk her down that aisle, and I didn't know whether I was going to be here or not. You see, I didn't know whether I was going to make it or not, even after I got to the hospital, because I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know whether my back was broke, or everything felt like everything was broke, just a cold. And there's no way knowing whether I was going to come out of there then or not, because I made the the girl taking care of me while I was waiting on the doctor, I made her take down a lot of information that in case I didn't live very long, who was in that car, and I made her write it down. In the hours, days, and weeks that followed, a massive recovery effort was underway. Traffic had begun to back up, and a crowd gathered as anxious families and the curious converged on the spot where the bridge used to be. A command center was set up here at the Mason County Courthouse. The county's 49-member Civil Defense Unit snapped into action. Communications were set up first, and if necessary, the unit was capable of setting up a 200-bed hospital 
complete with x-ray equipment and two operating rooms, all within hours from a packaged disaster hospital. It wasn't necessary. Half a block away at the Trinity Methodist Church, a canteen was set up to feed the workers. My mother was a volunteer here that night. She spoke of how out on the river, a crane was dredging the bottom for cars. As it brought each car to the surface, it let out an eerie whistle that could be heard throughout the valley. Divers went about the grim task of locating cars underwater, tying buoys to mark the spot for the crane to dredge. Morgues were set up at the National Guard Armory in Point Pleasant and Grace United Methodist Church in Gallup Police. Most of the bodies were recovered within a few days while family members kept watch on the riverbank. A lot of people just stayed here day and night. A lot of the members of the families that, that were lost. Paul Scott's friends, James Pullen and Fred Miller, were found the day after Christmas, still in their car. Dickie Maxwell's car was brought up on the 20th. When they brought it up, five days later, we knew it was his. Um, he lived next door to a woman that was also on the bridge, and they found her the same day. Um, they were also at the same funeral home and buried the same day. Out of 46 lives lost, 44 bodies were eventually recovered. The last, six months later, on June 22nd of 1968. Family and friends began a slow, painful healing process. It was, it was horrible. It was a horrible five days of waiting. And it was, it was awful right before Christmas burying your brother. And knowing that there's still people that haven't been found, knowing that their family is probably still waiting and probably will never hear anymore. Um, I'm glad they found him. I'm glad we could, we could bury him and go on because it would be horrible not knowing. Because you'd, I would have to think you'd have to wonder for sure all these years if he was really on it, if they didn't have the body. I, I, would, I would still be wondering. We, uh, we had some friends that were on it that, that their body were recovered later on. And uh, it's just something that I guess probably will be in my mind all my life but, uh, because it uh, was really a rough thing. It's hard to believe how time can hide the scars of a tragedy like this. The years can turn this into this. It's a field now, but it was once the Ohio approach to the Silver Bridge. After the bridge fell, some proposed keeping the approach as a memorial. However, it was later decided that the area would be better served without such an obvious constant reminder of an event that many would just as soon forget. It's, it's almost impossible to believe that that bridge went across there where it did. I, we come across there every week, come into the Route 7 off of 35 every week, and we go down there a lot, me and Jenny, but it, it's almost impossible that, that bridge was ever there. It looks like everything is gone and grown up different and everything. At that time, this road here was was just blanketed with traffic coming and going. This is a north main north north south route, you know. As 1967 gave way to 1968, highway officials began dealing with the loss of a key component of that north south highway. A task force was formed, and on February 7th, President Lyndon Johnson announced that a replacement bridge would be finished in half the normal time. The promise was kept. They went down south and found a bridge down there would meet this particular span that they needed, which was a four-lane bridge. And they started to build it real quick. They cut out a lot of red tape, and they opened and dedicated the new four-lane silver bridge exactly two years from the day it fell, which was December 15, 1969, when it opened. It was named the Silver Memorial Bridge. 
From the wreckage of the old Silver Bridge, a legacy began to grow. And I was guilty over the years about the two buddies. And here I am, working, having a good time, doing what they like to do. But in the later years, it kind of left me because I looked back and there was 46 people lost their lives. And due to them losing their lives, they've been not only in the state of Ohio, West Virginia, but there's been thousands and thousands of lives saved due to the, somebody getting on the ball and fixing up these bridges. Now, they've done a pretty good job of it. The state of Ohio has, and these other states probably has too. And of course, that's kind of left me. I don't feel so guilty because I know a lot of these babies out here today living because then people lost their lives. That's the way I feel about it. I agree with that. I agree because they all need to be inspected. I mean, anything that has that much traffic on it should be inspected regularly for safety. I mean, that that's, goes without saying. I mean, we lost 46 people, you know. Bridges were inspected more carefully from that point on. A sister to the Silver Bridge near Marietta, also constructed with I-bar chain suspension techniques, was promptly closed and dismantled. The business district of Point Pleasant was changed forever. The new bridge was constructed downstream on the other side of the mouth of the Kanawha River. The town's economy was seriously damaged as the constant stream of traffic no longer flowed through downtown. For Paul Scott, bittersweet memories are kept in a scrapbook. Amazingly, he'd suffered only scratches and bruises in the collapse of the bridge. Two weeks later, he walked his daughter down the aisle. And every year, on December 15th, his wife serves ham, remembering a similar meal 25 years ago that he never made it home for. It makes you feel good that you didn't were able to save some that survived. And in fact, uh, that Frank Wamsley that lived here in town, he, he passed away a year or two ago. And, uh, but, uh, but he had some years that he wouldn't have otherwise had if he hadn't have survived to the bridge. Of the 64 people in 31 cars at the time of the disaster, only two never came home. One body yet to be recovered is that of a 10-year-old Ordnance Elementary School student. The thing in my career that really bothered me more than anything else was seeing children killed in automobile accidents or maimed in any way. That's really what affected my heart more than anything else. Of the 46 lives lost that night, six were under the age of 14. It's an event now committed to time and memory. But years later, most local residents can remember clearly where they were and what they were doing the day the bridge fell. Every time I cross a bridge, I think about it. Every year at Christmas time, I think about it. Because we buried him two days before Christmas. And you have to think about it. It just, it, it dampens your spirits for Christmas, but it gets easier every year. But it's, it's been 25 years, and it, it's still there. You know, you still remember. One year after the Silver Bridge tragedy, the Point Pleasant Register published this retrospective, The Scar is Healing. It spoke poignantly of the horrible cost of that night and the new era that lay ahead. Now, 25 years into that era, there's no question that the wound of December 15th, 1967 has healed, but a scar will remain forever. I'm Brad Harvey. Thanks for joining us. Good night.